this kind of obsessive fixation on the other as a source of your own desires is first laid out by Cervantes, but for Girard it becomes increasingly unhealthy as this model or mediator becomes a figure closer and closer to you in, in social space. René Girard claimed that he discovered or elaborated the principle of mimetic desire through reading novels. And in fact, he attributes the discovery, really, of this principle of mimetic desire to several important novelists who he believes, you know, possessed this insight before he did and, and from whom he borrowed this insight and, and simply elaborated it further. So the first of these, who is the first novelist he discusses in his first book, uh, Deceit, Desire in the Novel, is Don Quixote by Cervantes, which is a novel from the early 17th century in Spain. And the basic premise of Don Quixote may be familiar to you, but I will recap it. We have as our protagonist, uh, Don Quixote is a somewhat aging um, knight, uh, at least by rank. And he, you know, is, is in a society where, um, you know, perhaps generations earlier, uh, people of his rank might have gone on crusades or might have, um, you know, gone and participated in wars um, against, the, uh, against the Muslims in the south of Spain. But, you know, much of that has, has ceased to be, a, you know, a, a viable path. And so he's basically an impoverished figure of high status who doesn't really have much to do with himself. So he spends all his time reading. And he, um, in the process of, of reading, and, and the, the novels he's reading or the, the books he's reading are what are called chivalric romances, which are essentially, you know, we could think here of Arthurian legends, right? That they're essentially stories about knights, a kind of romanticized image of knights like himself, who in earlier times, you know, could have all of these adventures, could, um, could you know, uh, pursue honor and could, um, you know, gain all sorts of recognition for engaging in heroic feats and battles and things like that. So in other words, he's kind of living vicariously a fantasy of, you know, the, the romantic life that might have once been a- available to someone of his status, right? And he becomes so obsessed with this fantasy that he becomes unable to distinguish between reality and this this sort of um, novelistic fantasy that he's immersed himself in. And so famously he goes out and, you know, he um, imagines that he sees some windmills and imagines that they're giants and, you know, uh, charges his horse towards them with his lance out and basically just kind of crashes into them and falls on the ground. But, you know, none of these experiences until quite late in the novel persuade, you know, are, are capable of, um, of dispelling this illusion, right? That, um, he's, that he's, you know, living in this fantasy world of knights and ladies and damsels in distress and, and giants and monsters and so on. And so, you know, the whole novel is really a a comedy about his, um, you know, obsession with, uh, living in a world that does not actually resemble the, the world that's, that's around him. Right. And so his, his illusions are constantly confronted with reality, but he nevertheless, um, stays true to his illusions. Right. And in fact, for many people, um, particularly in the romantic era, he, he became seen himself as a kind of positive model, right? Because he didn't, you know, he was indifferent to the kind of vulgarity and meaninglessness of the increasingly kind of commercial and unglamorous and unheroic world around him, which is essentially the emerging modern world, and instead stayed true to these noble ideals and illusions, right? And so he actually became seen as as sort of a positive figure. Um, but Cervantes himself, the novelist who, who wrote this book, you know, is pretty explicit that he did not see it this way. In fact, largely the aim of the book explicitly was to kind of parody these popular romance novels of the period, which, you know, he saw as kind of, you know, schlocky and, um, and, you know, just ridiculous in their lack of realism and, and so on. So, you know, Cervantes was really trying to debunk these, these other novels that he saw as kind of competitors. Don Quixote 
later though again became kind of seen almost in in opposition to this as as himself a noble ideal right of somebody who placed the ideal above the real so this is kind of the standard debate about what the meaning of this novel is right is it is it fundamentally a kind of a kind of um over the top satire that's making fun of idealism and and kind of head in the clouds um denial of reality or is it you know, the opposite, is it a kind of celebration of this figure who stays true to his ideals regardless of the kind of mundane, vulgar reality around him. So Girard, um, you know, in a way introduces an interpretation that, that goes beyond both of these standard readings. And what he argues is that, you know, what we see in the figure of Don Quixote is a, is a new kind of modern personality, right? And this is simply the person who is, um, who entirely subjugates his own um, sense of self to some kind of model who he idealizes or deifies, right? And so he, he doesn't, you know, his older, um, the, the older social world that he was part of that would have given him a sense of purpose in life is gone, right? It doesn't exist anymore. So he's kind of floundering. He doesn't know what he wants or should do with his life. And so he seeks out this model, right, which happens to be the hero of these romance novels, right? Amadis de Gaula. So Amadis becomes his kind of lodestar or star, right? Becomes the figure to whom he subordinates all of his desires, right? He says, you know, the only things I want are the things that Amadis has or, or himself pursues. And so he's a figure of this modern individual who's kind of lost in the world. And so he deifies and, and idealizes some other individual, in this case, a fictional or fantasy figure, um, in order to give himself some kind of direction in life. And so Cervantes explicitly represents this as a kind of madness, right? A kind of insanity. And, you know, I think it's, it's a type of story that we're familiar with today, right? When we think about, um, you know, what leads certain people to, I mean, a, a kind of dark version of this is like this idea, and I'm not judging whether this is accurate or not, like what leads some people to commit mass shootings? Well, according to some versions, it's they're so immersed in this world of video games that they fundamentally identify themselves with these figures in video games who are just, you know, going around and slaughtering people and so on. And right. So, and so they, they sort of subordinate their desires and will to this fictional figure who, you know, provides them with some kind of direction that they otherwise lack. So for Cervantes, I mean, and, and in Girard's reading, um, this is a kind of new, it's a new illness that has to do with the kind of aimlessness and directionlessness of a modern world in which people's social roles have been, have been um, weakened, right? And people's sense of purpose as determined by their traditional social role has been taken away. And so they look for direction, sometimes to real other people, but sometimes to, to fictional characters, right? And so a lot of ideas about the dangerous potential influence of, of movies, of video games, and so on, kind of continues with this, this notion that, that Cervantes originated. So one final point to make, though, is that for Girard, this is just the first step in a process in the development of this modern individual who subjugates his desires entirely to the will of another and who you know, becomes obsessively mimetically um, driven right, in terms of this you know, seeking out some kind of model and simply imitating that person at every turn. Um, what, you know, what differentiates Cervantes was from some of the later figures in novels that Girard an analyzes is that there is still a fundamental distance between him and his, um, his model, right, who is Amadis. Um, what Girard traces later in Deceit, Desire, in the novel is that what we see in, in later novels by writers like Stondhal, Dostoevsky, and Flaubert is that these novelists uh, um, discover the same phenomenon, right, of somebody becoming obsessively fixated on some model that they base all of their desires and behaviors on. But often this person is somebody who's not a fictional person, you know, far away in some fantasy realm. It's a person in their immediate social milieu, right? And this becomes a source of intense, um, you know, conflict and um, of intense pathology where essentially... You know, just this person who, for whatever reason, is selected as a, as a kind of ideal, right, um, is, you know, someone you become obsessed with, someone you become often embroiled in this kind of pathological rivalry with, because on one hand, they set the terms of your desire. On the other hand, they seem to possess this thing that you lack, right? And so 
this this kind of obsessive fixation on the other that you know as a, as a source of your own desires is first laid out by Cervantes, but for Girard it becomes increasingly unhealthy as this model or mediator becomes closer, a figure closer and closer to you in, in social space. So I think Don Quixote, as Girard reads it, is really, you know, still a very relevant text for many of the issues we think about. But another point that he makes is that, you know, it, it may seem to stranger and, and crazier to be um, to, so obsessed and heavily influenced by somebody who is simply a fictional character, but Girard actually argues that in some ways that may end up being healthier than some of the dynamics that develop, um, you know, later on in the kind of psychological history of moder- of the modern world, where the the mediator is somebody you you take to be a kind of god who possesses everything that you lack, and yet that person is is extremely close to you, right? Is is somebody who you have to encounter every day, and so he argues that many of the pathologies and perversions in characters in, in novels, particularly of, of writers like Dostoevsky and Proust, are, are the same structure, but when it's kind of compressed into a, a claustrophobic social space. So, you know, more could be said about this, but I, I think, again, Don Quixote provides the original model for this kind of modern psychology that Girard wants to trace out. Hey, what's up? If you enjoyed this video, take a second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. We publish videos like this several times a week. And also, if you're interested in studying the work of Rene Girard on your own, we made an awesome, totally free 18-page study guide that you can download at girardcourse.com. It's expertly curated. It's in a logical sequence that's going to help you master his entire body of work at your own pace. You can go ahead and get that at girardcourse.com. All right, that's all I got for you. Over and out.